so I was watching this video of a conversation uh, between the physicist Lawrence Krauss and uh, the philosophers Daniel Dennett and Massimo Pigliucci. And, you know, I was glad to see that they they did have an actual conversation. You know, they moved the conversation forward, in other words, whereas most of these uh, media spectacles where um, public intellectuals get together and talk with one another, um, they turn into uh, debates, really, and they're framed as debates where, you know, each debater holds a position which is defined in advance as irreconcilable with his opponents, and so, you know, in my opinion, I don't even understand why these, should, these sorts of engagements should take place. They lower the standards of public uh, engagement, intellectual engagement, um, but I was glad to see in this particular case, despite the, um, the context surrounding this meeting between these three men, um, they were able to move the conversation forward and speak to one another. And I, I really think that Krauss was in over his head and actually learned something important uh, in this exchange. Um, you know, the background here is that about a year ago, Krauss said some things in an interview that was published in a magazine, um, a prominent magazine, I forget which one, but he, he said that basically modern science doesn't need philosophy anymore and that um, the worst philosophers are those who do philosophy of science because, you know, no scientist, no practicing scientist really cares what a philosopher of science says. The only people who read philosophy, philosophy of science are other philosophers of science, says Krauss. Um, so, you know, he... He said some pretty disparaging things about this this discipline known as philosophy, and immediately after this was published, uh, Daniel Dennett, who was friends with Krauss, wrote him an open letter and said, "Hey, actually, you should apologize. You are wrong. Here's why." And you know, Krauss kind of backpedaled and he issued a sort of faux apology, in my opinion. But um, a little while later, uh, Massimo Pigliucci wrote his own response that was published on his blog and, you know, called Krauss to task and ended up kind of calling him an anti-intellectual moron. Um, you know, I'll post links to all of these uh, blog posts and, and interviews and so on. Uh, read it. Then watch this discussion. It's important to know this context. Um, and, you know, this is one of my favorite conversations. They, they talked a little bit about religion and God and the science religion culture war and I'm very interested in that conversation because I think it in order to frame science and religion in an honest um, way I think you need to actually do philosophy so this conversation forces us to do philosophy together you know if we're going to talk about science and what it is and religion and what it is and, and what science and religion do in society as as cultural activities that human beings engage in, then we're going to need to do philosophy, which I, I do think, you know, I'm biased maybe, but I do think philosophy is a higher order activity. It's not theology, it's not religious belief, but it's also not uh, scientific experimentation or, or, or theoretical uh, construction even. I think once you start doing theoretical construction, and um, whether that's th theological or um, scientific in an experimental, you know, in a, in a, in a testable way. Uh, but, but theology is ex experiential, at least, if not experimental in its own way. So, but, but as soon as you start doing theory, be it about God or nature, um, you're starting to verge on philosophy. Um, you're verging, right? But philosophy is more general than either theology or, or science. And I think it's important to be able to exist in that philosophical space. Otherwise, there's no way for us to mediate between these two important value spheres, namely science and religion. And so I, I disagree really with all three uh, of, of the men in this conversation, Pigliucci, Dennett, and, and Krauss, because they're all atheists. Um, whereas I think, no, theology, God talk is still s a significant um, aspect of reality. Certainly sociologically and anthropologically, obviously, you know, religion is an important, important natural phenomenon as, as a thing that human animals do 
and Dennett would agree with this certainly, but also it's important, not just, you know, in these ways, but I think it's an, it's an important cosmological phenomenon. You know, even when we do natural science, there's uh, a way in which, especially mechanistic science, like the sort that, that Krauss and, you know, most other, almost every other natural scientist now practices, it's, there's, um, they're all working within a mechanistic paradigm and, and mechanism emerged from the, the Cartesian method of, of doing science, um, the Cartesian ontology really, uh, as you know, that half of reality, which we call nature. Um, but you know, for Descartes, nature was designed by, um, an all powerful God, uh, sort of a mathematician. Newton shared this this theological picture of nature with with Descartes, um, and if if science even if science nowadays doesn't talk about a designer anymore, even if it says that the the physical constants and the physical laws just sort of accidentally emerged, rather than having been intelligently designed, there's still the need to talk about this thing that's outside the universe that gave rise to or caused the universe. The universe is an effect of something else, right? And for Krauss, it's, you know, what he calls nothing, and he thinks he can tell us what nothing is using nothing but, but scientific theory and um, at least potentially testable uh, um, models, uh, mathematical models. So, you know, in his book, he, he tried to define nothing the nothing that was before the Big Bang as the quantum vacuum. And of course, you know, other philosoph philosophers were, were wondering, well, if you're saying that quant the quantum vacuum is, is what there was before there was anything, then you're not saying that it's nothing because the quantum vacuum, as science understands it, has certain properties. It, it's definitely something. You know, it behaves according to the quantum field equations predictions, right? So it's not nothing. Um, and I think here it's obvious that in order to talk about nothing, absence, and so on, you're going to need to do philosophy because it, in a way, I think it implicates the one doing the questioning into uh, the problem that is at hand, you know. When we begin to ask, where did the universe, universe come from? What was there before space and time emerged onto the scene? Um, we start to get uh, our mood shifts, right? We start to become maybe a little queasy, maybe a little uncomfortable, even and nervous, anxious, because our, our understanding of the world of space and time that we live in in our everyday experience we start to wonder if that's just a construct and that what's really going on is something far more strange and mysterious um you know we become metaphysical we start to experience wonder you know for aristotle who you know gets made fun of a bit or dismissed i think too quickly by both kraus and by pigliucci who said oh well, no one does no one takes Arist aristotle seriously anymore um but in Aristotle, he says, philosophy begins in wonder. You know, the, exper the experience of wonderment is, is the sort of, it's, a, it's the prerequisite for doing philosophical work. Um, and it seems that Krauss, you know, unlike many other scientists, Krauss seems to have lost his wonder, I think. And he, he assumes that... Mm, there's no more room for that experience, for the philosophical experience of wonder, now that science has explained everything according to, you know, the model, the working model, the working paradigm of, of our day. But that's just it, right? This is the working paradigm. Krauss is working from within the working paradigm of our day. And because he didn't take uh, philosophy seriously, or the philosophy of science seriously, um, probably the history of science seriously and the history of human reflection upon their experience in the world he doesn't realize that you know his model is not the be-all and end-all uh, of 
the human mind. Um, and the human mind's uh, context in the universe. None of our models of the world encompass the world that they are encompassed themselves by the world, right? Um, so even if we did have a complete scientific understanding of the universe, we would still need a philosophical account of that, that, that accounted for how such an account a scientific account were possible. What is the relationship then, you know, between the human mind, which has this complete knowledge, and the the um, objective natural world that that it has completely described and understood? There's still many philosophical questions left over, even if we grant that such a thing as a complete science, a complete physics, is possible. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw a few of my own um, ideas into this conversation. I really like to think about these things and when people who do disagree with one another are able to have a conversation the way that Pigliucci and Denon and Krauss did, uh, it makes me um, a little more optimistic about you know the chances for a sort of integral culture that wouldn't find itself bifurcated between a scientific atheistic understanding of, of a meaningless material world or a religious um, theistic understanding of the world that uh, accepts um, truths given from uh, the past, given to other men's minds, and, and, and just obey um, the doctrines uh, of the religious books. You know, I think there's a there are many middle paths between sort of scientific materialistic atheism and uh, um, religious uh, creationist theism. And I would want to start talking more about that. Uh, and also, I'm going to post a link to, um, a, I guess it's a book, it's a long essay or a book about uh, Alfred North Whitehead and his relevance as a philosopher, but also a mathematical physicist to um, contemporary scientific cosmology because I think, uh, you know, 20th century physics hasn't actually uh, found itself uh, a new ontology after the Newtonian ontology, the, the, the Cartesian-Newtonian paradigm was destroyed by quantum and relativistic physics. Uh, there isn't, you know, scientists have dismissed philosophy um, when what when they've need when they now need it more than than ever before, you know, and I think Whitehead offers us a new ontology, a new metaphysics that is coherent with uh, the new science, quantum theory, relativity theory, evolutionary theory, um, <clears throat> and and human psychology too.